Right now at 11, why the number of non-citizens registered to vote in Oregon just skyrocketed. We are taking this very seriously. With some officials trying to put it into perspective and other lawmakers calling for action. Plus, our lives are on the line and our lives are in their hands and we just want to know that they care about our lives. Fear and frustration in Gresham after a teenager threatened someone with a gun, then brought it to school. Then bringing Major League Baseball to a prime piece of Portland? The deal reportedly in the works that could someday land a ballpark on the waterfront. And who said summer was over as we track an unusual spike of late September heat? Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko. Our top story tonight, more than 1,200 non-citizens have been mistakenly registered to vote in Oregon. A sharp uptick from the 300 or so originally flagged. And records show nine up from two have already cast a ballot. Alma McCarty's in the newsroom to walk us through this investigation. Alma? Well, David, there's still several parts of this that the DMV and the Secretary of State's office continues to look into, but based on the findings so far, they firmly believe this was a clerical error, a data processing error, and not a coordinated effort to register non-citizens to vote. Out of the 3 million registered voters in Oregon, state officials say the eligibility of a small fraction has been called into question. The DMV has finished their analysis and found a total of uh, 1,259 individuals incorrectly sent to the Secretary of State for automatic voter registration. Of those potentially ineligible, leaders say nine people have a voting history. Non-citizen voting remains exceedingly rare both in Oregon and around the country. Both the Secretary of State and the DMV stated that they regret the mistake, which they believe to be a data processing error. They went on to explain how it could happen. A staffer at the DMV selects the wrong item from a drop-down menu when someone's getting an ID, listing the document presented to them as a U.S. passport instead of a foreign one. From there, the person would be automatically registered to vote through Oregon's Motor Voter Program. All the data we've looked at indicates that that really is the crux of the problem, so a true clerical error. The error we're talking about today impacted 1,259 records. That's 0.1% of all the registrations that have come through the DMV. So while any error needs to be taken seriously, and we are taking this very seriously, we can take com some comfort in the fact that the system is generally working correctly. Officials told reporters Monday they've already taken proactive steps to prevent future errors, from retraining workers and fixes to the data entry procedures, to extra confirmation and verification prompts. However, some Oregonians, like House Republicans, still want a better explanation from these government agencies about what went wrong. Here's Representative Anna Scharf, whose district covers parts of Yamhill and Polk counties. Now, there are a lot of elections, local small elections, school board election, county commissioner elections, ballot measures that are decided by less than 10 votes. I myself lost re-election for a school board uh, position in 2019 by three votes. Every vote matters. Representative Scharf and her colleagues in Salem pressing for a formal hearing to assure voters of a robust election system in the state. It just relieves a lot of um, public anxiety about our election process. So why not come in and answer those questions? Now, it's not entirely clear if all 1,259 are non-citizens. Officials have said that they were incorrectly identified as eligible at the DMV. Some may, in fact, be eligible. They'll just have to re-register with the proper documentation. None of those inactivated will receive a ballot for the 2024 election. David? Yeah, it sounds like there are still more than a few questions here. Thanks, Alma. Appreciate that update. All right, let's give you a live look outside now from our Wells Fargo Sky Camera. 70 degrees in the Rose City as we gear up for hot weather on Tuesday with temperatures that are likely to approach 90. Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino is here. Matt, the good news for those of us longing for fall, it sounds like at least it's going to be short-lived, right? Well, you know what? Today was the day uh, of Equilux where we have equal day and equal night, which means that tomorrow nighttime will be a little bit longer than the daytime hours and minutes, which means you just don't have as much time to heat up or stay hot. So I really think it's going to be more of a curiosity than a concern. Now, a couple things. I'm showing you Newport right now because fog is beginning to form at the coast. 54 degrees, 100% humidity, and no wind. Now, 
If we're really going to see temperatures soar tomorrow, we would already be seeing the east wind extending out to Newport. And in fact, we're not really seeing any east wind. Maybe a little bit of trout tail, but only three miles an hour. So the wind is basically calm there. Everybody else seeing calm winds as well. And even out through the gorge, not seeing much wind at Hood River. Didn't see anything at Crown Point or at Corbett. So the east wind has yet to kick in. Without that, we'll struggle to get much above 90, but we will certainly be very warm tomorrow. Here's the hour by hour forecast beginning at noon and by two o'clock we will be warmer than we were all day today, getting up to 84 and then the modeling peaking is about 88. I think 89 or so 88 to 90 is where we're going to end up tomorrow, which again isn't that intolerable, especially when the you know, nighttime comes on sooner this time of the year, but it will be hot tomorrow. We'll actually get some showers on Wednesday. I'll let you know what that's looking like. The chance of any appreciable rain is looking less and less. And the last weekend of September brings a lot of sunshine. We'll take a look at the whole week. David, back to you. Sounds great. Thank you, Matt. To get you caught up on tonight's other headlines now, a jury handed down a verdict today in a wrongful death lawsuit involving a security guard who killed a man in a North Portland Lowe's parking lot in 2021. Jurors found the property owner as well as Lowe's negligent to some extent. TMT Development is accused of failing to vet the security company. Logan Gimbel, the guard who shot the victim, was not certified to carry a gun. Gimbel was convicted of second degree murder in a criminal trial last year and sentenced to life in prison. The victim, family of the victim, rather, Freddie Nelson Jr., has been awarded some $20 million. A new Portland homeless shelter is still empty months after its June grand opening. The Arbor Lodge shelter off North Lombard in Denver is supposed to house up to 120 people long term. In a statement to Willamette Week, the county says it's waiting on the right permit from the city. But today the city told us it is waiting on the county to schedule inspections before it can issue that permit. County officials now say they aim to open the shelter sometime in October. And to a traffic alert across the Willamette where eastbound lanes on the Hawthorne Bridge are closing each night at 7 and reopening at 11 the following morning. This runs until Saturday morning and is for maintenance and paving work. Pedestrians will need to use the opposite sidewalk and cyclists may need to detour. Well, we are following up this evening on frustration and fear at Gresham High after police say a student brought a loaded gun to class after threatening someone on the street. Catherine Cook is here. So Catherine, what are students asking for now? Well, David, they're asking for more awareness, anything to keep them safe. They're asking the district to do whatever they can. Some teachers are demanding metal detectors. They're afraid other students are bringing guns into school, but just not being caught. Our lives are on the line and our lives are in their hands and we just want to know that they care about our lives. Elizabeth Westbrook sending a message to leadership at Gresham High School. She and other students say they don't like how the school handled an incident Friday involving a student who brought a gun to school. They felt that we should have went into at least a hold or a lockdown. Gresham police arrested a 17 year old late Friday morning after he allegedly threatened a person with a gun outside of school, then brought the firearm inside. That victim called Gresham High School. School security identified a possible suspect, then moved him to a secure area. The student wouldn't let anyone search him, but as police arrived, he admitted to having a gun. Police say that gun was fully loaded with one round in the chamber. If that search went south, everybody who was coming in during lunch could have been put at risk, and my life would have been at risk. I'm really thankful that just nothing happened to anyone at the school. Mauricio Gomez is a community liaison at Gresham High School. He says students and staff have been on edge since Friday. Very worried um, just knowing that there was someone walking the hallways with, with a weapon, um, not knowing at any moment what could have been happening. The teachers union tells KGW they question whether district protocol was followed Friday and whether those protocols do enough to stop threats. The Gresham Barlow School District shared this statement with us saying, we appreciate the work of our district and school staff to safely deal with the situation and we thank the community member who provided us with the information necessary to investigate and bring closure to this incident. Only by working as a school community in partnership with parents and the community can we create and maintain the level of safety we want for our students and staff. Last school year, Elizabeth and other students went to the school board. They shared concerns over a string of incidents, including drug use and frequent violent fights. They asked school officials to raise more awareness and renew their plea this year. They still said they wouldn't, and then the incident on Friday occurred. 
and we believe that if they had raised more awareness towards these things, it would have been more preventable. Police say this is an ongoing investigation. The teen suspect is facing three charges, unlawful possession of a firearm, possession of a firearm in a public building, and carrying a concealed weapon. David, yeah, back to you. Obviously concerning there, Catherine. Thank you for your reporting on that. New tonight, the union that represents some 30,000 Boeing aerospace machinists now into week two of their strike appears to be somewhat pushing back against what Boeing calls its final offer. The new offer includes a wage increase of 30% over the next four years, a ratification bonus of $6,000 that is double the previous offer and an increased 401k match. Now, if the union approves the offer, Boeing says average pay would increase from some $75,000 a year to about 110,000. Well, tonight in a Facebook post, union leadership called the offer a quote, show of disrespect by setting a deadline for a vote and not negotiating directly with the union. With an offer, it says misses the mark. This is complete garbage. You know, it's, just, it's again, they're just thinking we'll just Take it without a second thought, but they need us. We're all voting no. We're sticking together and we're voting no because we know we can get something better. Our team uh, that are out on the picket line, they're not our enemy. They're the people that are going to come back and build this magnificent airplane for us as we move forward. And we need to be focused on being shoulder to shoulder and getting that done. All right, Boeing has set a deadline of Friday at 11.59 p.m. for the union to accept the offer. And while the union says that does not give it enough time, it does add it plans to survey its members on next steps. We'll keep you posted. All right, it is a big day in Northwest sports. And up first, an update on the long-running effort to bring a major league baseball team to the Rose City. Once again, it appears the Portland Diamond Project has reportedly picked its spot to build a ballmark, ballpark. Rather, Willamette Week, the Oregonian, and John Gonzano all reporting the group has an agreement or a near agreement to buy 33 acres of land on the south waterfront at the Zydell Yards property. According to Canzano, early plans for the stadium district would include retail, hotel, and more residential development, though. Even if a deal goes through, there's the other key part of this, whether Portland could land an MLB team. Kind of crucial, right? Meanwhile, Portland Trailblazers fans now know their options for watching the team as a new season approaches. That includes Blazer Vision. It's a direct streaming service available through most of Oregon and Washington. Games will also air on TV in the Northwest on Sinclair stations. The regular season starts October 23rd. And more sports news. The Pac-12 appears one step closer to staying alive. ESPN reporting Utah State has accepted an invitation to leave the Mountain West and join the Pac-12. They would be the seventh member of the rebuilt conference. We we're calling it the Pac-6. I guess that is done now. The Pac-12 needs uh, eight schools to remain an official conference.